Thanks so much. And you're ready for this? You've I'm signed ready. up for this program right now, okay? I'm ready. You ready? I'm ready. This isn't exactly like uh, using one of the gadgets up at Mayo, but it, it may have some uh, extraordinary results nonetheless. Well, we admire you for doing this. Um, All right. You did I'm a little theater? I'm a volunteer. Did a little theater in your college days? A little right? bit. A little bit? All right. Not very good either. Going to do a lot more tonight. Yeah. Please uh, welcome uh, Attain Danger, who's uh, uh, an improv theater director, writer, and, uh, and founder of a number of theaters, the Gustavus Adolphus College Line Us troupe still exists today, the Walrus Improv Company, he also was a founding member of in Minneapolis, and the Theater of Public Policy, which you're going to see tonight, is the fusion of Tain's experience working in nonprofits uh, and in the public policy realm. I mean, anyone who works in theater understands that nonprofit is what it's all about, right? Um, but uh, in Tain's particular resume, um, he worked as uh, uh, someone who was involved with government and government policy, and the fusion of improv theater as a way of jogging people and forcing people to think differently about public policy issues is really what the theater of public policy is all about. He is one, uh, he's uh, the founder, co-founder of Danger Boat Productions with uh, his partner and fellow improviser, Brandon Boat. And they have extraordinary names, by the way, Tane Davis and Brandon Boat. I mean, that's just by itself. You have to form a theater company if that is your name. Um, and uh, both of them are uh, artists in residence at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. Take it away, Tane Danger. Thank you. Oh, boy. Uh, hello, thank you all so much. Uh, we are really excited for this evening. Uh, as Mr. Hockenberry said, we uh, use improv comedy to bring alive different issues and different public policy conversations. Uh, this one is big and this one is really exciting and we're so pleased to be here with you tonight. I really wish that I could hear how this was all going to be translated into Korean, but uh, <laughs> later. Uh, but for now, please uh, put your hands together for our cast, the cast of the Theater of Public Policy. So I'm going to talk to Mr. Gephardt for a few minutes, and our cast is going to be taking in everything that we say, and they're going to bring this all to life. It's completely unscripted, completely based just on what we talk about right now and a little bit of perhaps what Mr. Gephardt said previously. We're actually going to come to you all in the second half of the show for some questions. So please start thinking about some of the things that you would like to ask, and uh, with that, um, well, thank you. I am uh, yes. Thank you to reinforce what Mr. Hagenberry said for for agreeing to do this. We're very pleased, uh, and I'm excited because you have been part of this conversation for decades Ever. and forever. <laughs> and when they put, do you remember when they put that snake around the pole, like in the yeah, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I, mean, I knew George Washington very well. <laughs> You did a good job getting across the Delaware. I, I, I mean, but it, it is interesting because health care policy is something that has been talked about in Washington for at least 100 years, if not forever. Um, you know, the idea that th there should be a national effort to do health care should be. And, you know, I, I, there was a lot of m momentum, obviously, in the 90s when you were there, and then more recently around the Affordable Care Act. And we did something, or Washington did something, and it seems like nobody is particularly happy about it, and we want to keep doing that conversation for 100 years. Is that frustrating? A little bit. Um, so I was there with Clinton and Hillary, and we tried to do this in the mid-90s. And uh, I was majority leader at the time, and, and I couldn't get it out of committee. I mean, I couldn't get Democrats to vote for it. It was that controversial and difficult. So I'm not surprised that even after they finally limped over the finish line and got it done, which was really hard. I mean, I knew it would be hard, but it was, it's, it's, it's a bear. I mean, it's hard. That there would be controversy in the country. The other problem they had that I'm not being critical of them at all is that they passed it with all Democratic votes. 
And one of the problems you have in Congress when you do anything on one side alone is that then when it's passed, the other side wants to keep fighting it. You understand? Mm -hmm. So there's a thing in, the, you know, in our background called consent of the governed. It may even be in the Constitution. Consent of the governed. Politi you got to remember that politics is a substitute for violence. It really is. <laughs> it really is. I'm not, I'm not are, kidding. Are you threatening not, me? No. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. So I don't want to get religious with you, but I think we evolved from animals, and animals do their differences with violence. King of the hill, right? That's, how they, that's who has the power in a group of wolves or cows or whatever. <laughs> or donkeys and elephants. Donkeys and elephants. And so what we've evolved toward is politics, is settling differences by votes rather than violence. And in a lot of places, the violence is still the way they do it. Look at Syria every day. If you don't think politics, they don't have politics yet. They have violence. So that's what we've done. But when you pass something that's highly controversial, and one side alone is the only side that votes for it, the other side doesn't get any of their ideas in it, and I'm sure Democrats would say they didn't want any ideas in it, so they just stonewalled it, but whatever. When it's done, the people that were against it keep fighting it. Uh, I saw a number of cases where we passed highly controversial things, but we had, we had, a, you know, we had both sides involved in it. Well, so that's, that's why it's still up in the air. And, well, I'm just curious, how did the conversation change from the time that you were working on it in the 90s to, do you feel as though there were lessons learned that they incorporated into do, doing what they did in 2008, or were there things that they missed, obviously, you feel? I, I, I think they learned a lot from our mistakes, and, and that helped them get it done. One of the mistakes we made with Hillary and Bill was that we were trying to write the bill in the White House, and Congress you, you got to remember, Congress is 535 people. Just imagine you're a member of Congress now. You're in a group. How many people are in the room here? 535, exactly. Uh, <laughs> we planned it that way. You're all in Congress. So it's a huge group. And everybody has a vote. Everybody has an equal vote. So it's very hard to get that together. So having the White House send down edicts doesn't get you very far. You need to involve the members individually in writing the bill. And that's what they tried well, to do. Some of the rhetoric that I find really interesting is you do hear people uh, say that, you know, we have the, the perfect health care system. Or they were saying before we passed uh, the Affordable Care Act, and don't, we shouldn't mess with it, more or less. And, um, I, I, and it just seems curious to me, because, I mean, even as, as you were speaking, you know, we have done so much with health care, but so much of that seems to be geared towards the people who can afford it. It seems like this is a conversation more about health care access than whether or not what we're doing is good health care or not. And so I'm just curious about whether those, how those two things get conflated in the conversation and, and whether that's on purpose or if that just is happenstance. I, I think that often the whole debate devolves around getting, getting everybody covered. And I think you're right. You've got to remember, 85% of the American people have some kind of health coverage. So getting the other 15% covered was not really of great interest to the 85%. I mean, yeah, some of them understood that if we get more people involved, it could hold down my costs, I'm paying for them anyway, blah, blah, blah. But that's kind of esoteric. So when people thought about it, they thought, why screw up the system? I mean, I, it's OK. I got a doctor. I got health care coverage. So why are we so upset about these 15%? So that's part of the problem. And, and there was discussion in the Congress about how to do it better. We have a, things about accountable care organizations and how much of the premium. You know, there are all kinds and, of and reforms. And death panels, I believe. Yeah, death panels, we got those. <laughs> I don't think so. Do you get to be on a death panel? No. 
Only doctors are on death panels. <laughs> I, I, so, is, but I feel like the part of the question here, and after having been through it once and seen it all play out another time, is healthcare something that can be discussed and worked on in a political sense, or is it too big and too complicated for it to for it to be possible for the 300 million Americans to actually have a conversation about it? It's a really good question, and uh, one of my concerns about our democracy is that it's harder and harder to really involve all 535 members, much less a huge part of the public, in an adult debate, discussion, conversation about really complicated, tough issues like health care. Uh, let me just tell you an anecdote. So when we did the first big budget cutting in 1989, 1990, with George Bush the first, I was majority leader, and uh, he kept calling us down to the White House, said, we got to deal with the budget. We said, yeah, is everything on the table? He said, everything but taxes. I gave this speech in Houston, said, read my lips, no new taxes. We said, we know, but we want everything on the table. He finally put everything on the table. To me, a real act of leadership, a real act of leadership. And then we worked for nine months with all the members of the Congress to come up with the specifics of how you actually cut the budget. And then after we got all that done, we still didn't have a deal, so I took them out to Andrews Air Force Base for 10 days and nights and locked everybody up. They couldn't talk to anybody. 10 days and nights, we ate hot fudge Sundays together at night and everything. Sounds like fun. And it was, we gained weight. And, <laughs> and we got it done and we came back to the house. We had 120 members at Andrews working on this specifics. And we came back and we lost nine months of work. 10 days and nights, 10 hot fudge Sundays, and we <laughs> lost. That's how hard it is. Democracy is hard. <laughs> and healthcare is hard. It's complicated. It really is. So we need, and I, I worry that we're all running around with blackberries and blogging and running home and doing this and that, raising money and we need these members to really immerse themselves in a conversation with people like are in this room who really know something about health care and the problems you're presented with in, in changing it and innovating it so they can do more of the right things. And I hope that can happen. And I, I, I hope that people here can be part of that. I mean, I, I, obviously, I am very interested in the idea of having more conversations and having more people speak about this, but there were these very interesting studies that happened both in the 90s and during the debate in 2009, 2010, where uh, the more people like, spent time watching the news and listening and supposedly learning about healthcare, the more confused they were, the less they actually you know, could answer basic questions about what the Affordable Care Act or what have you right. would do. And so, I, I mean, I guess I, I would even, I would just almost reiterate the previous question. Is, are these things possible? And if so, how? How do you talk about this in a large way? Uh, is, it, is it that we just need to, should we like bring John Boehner and just handcuff him to somebody in this conference? <laughs> and does anybody volunteer for that, by the way? <laughs> I mean, I, I, it's a serious question. I mean, how do, you, how do you spark that conversation amongst people so that they don't just get sick of it? I, I think it can be done. I, I, it has to be done. We have no other choice because the federal government has a role in health care. It's not certainly the only thing. It's, it's a part of the picture. But it needs to be done better. It needs to be a better leader of doing the right things. And there's no substitute for educating the members, John Boehner, Nancy Pelosi, and everybody else. They, they all need information from people that really know what, what's going on. And, and you know, the part of the problem, it's a human thing. We all look for what I call one-eyed cats. I mean, we look- I was gonna ask you about that. Yeah, I've never well, heard that before. Yeah, well, and I worry about the cats. Have you seen a one-eyed cat? <laughs> <laughs> we all look for the answer, right? The silver bullet. Here, what's the silver bullet? Make it simple. 
Tell me what the answer to health care is. It, so a lot of people say it's getting the consumer to pay more. They'll be better shoppers. And there's some truth to that. But it's not a silver bullet. Other people will say we just need to make all the health care organizations not for profit. That's the problem. You got all these groups out there trying to make money. It's the wrong incentive in health care. Health care is different than anything else. Let's just mandate that everybody should be not for profit and then everything will be fine. Well, there's some truth in that, but that's not a silver. There is no silver bullet. I wish there was. Oh, God, I wish there was. I can't find it. We need to do the hard work. It's, it's like the budget. You know, people say, all you need to do is cut Medicare. Well, okay. There's some other things. <laughs> we need to talk about everything. And we need to go through the dirty detail of how you actually do this. You know, people say, well, just cut Medicare by $300 billion over 10 years and you solve the problem. Oh, that's good. <laughs> how did you do it? Waste, no, fraud, self and abuse. Yeah, right? waste, fraud, and abuse, exactly. So you got to get into the dirty details. You got to get people that know what's happening in the real world. And there has to be real work. People have to work to come up with better comprehensive answers. And there is, to, in my view, you know, the health care bill, probably too big, but it is a step forward. It will cause change. It will cause a continuing conversation. And maybe we can stay engaged and, and educate members better, educate the public better, and get better outcomes. Uh, there's one other piece of this that I wanted to, uh, out of what you were speaking about previously, and, and I mean, I think that a lot of people in this room, myself included, would agree with what you had said, that the Mayo Clinic is this wonderful model. And, you know, Obama has pointed to it, even I think George Bush pointed to it at times as just a place that really does these things right. Why can't we open up, as you suggested, franchises? Like, why can't we ha drop, pick up the Mayo Clinic and drop it into places all over the, the country and just reproduce that? It's really hard. Uh, so I think Mayo has uh, facilities in Arizona and maybe Florida, and that's a, that's a good thing. And maybe they could do some more. But there's no one, even Kaiser, Kaiser's kind of been a, a real leader on trying to region, get, get into all the regions of the country, and they haven't come close. United Healthcare is trying to figure this out, I think, and some others, but it's hard. It's really hard uh, because it is a cottage industry and it is community by community. I think one of the exciting things that I've heard from the Innovation Center here that I'm really excited about is the ability to use IT in order to get best practices out to lots and lots of doctors and hospitals all over the country so that the Mayo way, if you will. So I'm a St. Louis Cardinals fan. And we, in St. Louis, we talk about the cardinal way. That's kind of, you know, boastful, I think. But, but we feel we have a method of developing young players and dealing with the fans, and the whole thing is supposed to be one of the best. I don't know whether it is or not, but we think that. I think that about Mayo. I mean, I think Mayo has developed some great practices. You know, when I was here the last time, my doctor sent me over to the nutrition center and... They gave me the best information I've ever gotten about what I eat and how I should eat, how I should behave. They Seems got a like a lot of people are giving you advice on what to eat. Yeah, well, they are. <laughs> and I need it. Have Believe you, me, I need it. Were you eating a hot fudge sundae at the moment? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Too many hot fudge sundaes. But, but yeah, so I think there is a chance for a, an organization like Mayo and hopefully <clears throat> others to be able to affect change in, in broad areas of the country, not by putting bricks and mortar everywhere, but by using IT and other modern technologies to really get the stuff out there. And does, does government have a role in making that happen? Well, we, in the health care bill, probably in the stimulus bill, there, there was a lot of money from the federal government to help get all the docs and hospitals that weren't online to get, to get them IT. I, 
I, I haven't reviewed where it is or if it's working. I'm sure it's hit a lot of holes in the road and it's, you know, IT is kind of whatever. I mean, it, I, I won't. There are a lot of people who just <laughs> tweeted that. It's IT hard. is. Whatever, it, it's really hard. I'm on a bunch of boards and, you know, and all the companies when the IT guy comes there, the woman guy says, whoa, this is complicated. But we're getting there. I mean, I think it's happening slowly but surely. I know when I go to my doctors now, they, they all have a, a laptop or an iPad. That's, that's big progress. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, please give a big round of applause to Mr. Dick Gephardt. He is fantastic. And, <clears throat> and uh, as I said, we're going to come back in the second half of the show and open it up for some questions from you all for him. But for now, we're going to actually uh, turn over to our team of improvisers and just see what did, what did you all hear during our conversation with uh, Mr. Gephardt. That someone should be handcuffed to John Boehner. <laughs> OK, all right. And that was exciting to you. Good, all right. I was thinking that with so many wonderful healthcare partners in the room right now, that I, I really should take this opportunity. But I've got this thing on the back of my neck. If someone would <laughs> like, OK, we can do that later. I am. Um, I, I, was really intrigued by the IT part. I, I feel like we know each other pretty well. I had a colonoscopy last month, and it went, it went, it went well. It was good. And I liked that twilight anesthesia. I, I would have agreed to anything at that point. Um, but I do spend a lot of time on the computer now on WebMD and various sites. And um, I think it's a dangerous thing, because I, I don't want to leave the house anymore. Because if you look at my fingernails, they do seem to be changing color. I don't know, you, you probably can't see from where you're sitting. But if you saw them, you'd know. I'm really worried this entire performance will just be you all giving your particular things that you need diagnosed. But that's OK. That's why we're here. No, it's not. Um, I was struck by this idea of politics as a substitute for violence. And it, just, it brought me to this uh, vision of uh, like a fight club where you had to fight for the right for health care. I don't know how to articulate that any better than that. but. <laughs> Just Logan. <laughs> yeah, you know, and the Fight Club idea is great too, and it sounds like the one pacifier is hot fudge sundaes. And so if we could really just, or one-eyed kittens, which is a delicious idea, I think, too. So um, that's what I'm looking forward to oh, in the future. Of um, and Mark. Uh, the president had a beer summit uh, a couple years ago, so maybe a hot fudge summit, but we're, since we're walking, we're talking about our weight, we want to steam, uh, steam our trim. Maybe a yogurt or tofu summit to, to settle some of these issues. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, ladies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, without further ado, uh, our cast, as I mentioned, is going to take the stage. Everything that they do is completely made up on the spot. The, it's all unscripted, uh, created from what we were just speaking about. So please put your hands together for the Theater of Public Policy cast. <laughs> Senator Franken, I know you're in there. I'm a summer intern, and I need to get 535 people to help write this new bill, and this is going to be a long summer. So <clears throat> I just started a new job, and in order to get health care, I have to fight Judy from accounting. <laughs> um, I think I can take her. My goal, is, my goal is to live forever, but to do so, I cannot eat cheese. And so I will have to live forever unhappily. I've got IT answers to the healthcare problems and challenges we all face. We've talked about paperless bills. I'm proposing hospitalless, hospital-less surgeries. Yes, I'm a lobbyist. No, it's the least important, uh, uh, you know, issue in American politics, the hair care industry. I know. Yeah, I uh, beat up Timmy after school, which uh, was tough, but the principal was making me run for uh, student council, because politics is the opposite of violence, and so if I get into the student council, I'll stop beating people up, which would be great for the school's health. Um, and I've gone a step further, doctorless diagnoses. I am willing to give up cheese if I can have 15 more years. That's all I want. 
So I can take Judy, but I'm not quite sure about Sandra. She's in the uh, IT department. She's pretty tough. I have a Sunday, but Senator Klobuchar kept me waiting, and it's getting a bit drippy. I like this. It's a lot. No, it's good. It's a lot less stress. I used to be with the second most important, which is just a baby lobby. I got my votes raised by giving kids uh, swirlies in the toilet, which is the opposite of why I'm in this. But it's, it's a, I'm an old dog, and this is a new trick, or whatever. So it's an I bill and a U bill, but if it's an E bill, you don't have to pay it. So you just the make sure it's going to be a full It's just some garbage. I have to have an enchilada. Well. Stephen, I've been going over your uh, medical notes. Yeah, and no, Congress that's going to be. Congress has agreed to allow the tonsillectomy. Thank you so much. They, did, did they all vote for it? Or was it just some of them? No, it was, uh, it was right down the line. And no, I do not. I will not take a party line tonsillectomy. That is not OK with me. That is the only kind of tonsillectomy that I can give you. You take it back to them, and you tell them to cross the aisle or nobody crosses these tonsils. That's a good line. Let's use that line. We could use that line, but what's going to happen to your throat in the meantime? I don't care. I'll get some nodules for America. Oh. That's another slogan. All right, all right. <laughs> Let me use my iPhone. Surgeon General? Yeah, it's good to see you. I'm the speaker. We've got to make a deal. Shoot, shoot. <laughs> it was the Secretary's idea to keep us locked up together, literally, till we reach a deal. Uh, okay. Here's a quick photo for the website. Psh, all right. And you've got all to right. feed each other this fudge sundae together. Two straws. Could you guys please sign this? He needs a tonsillectomy. Use your left hands. I don't care. Uh -oh. Woo! <laughs> this is how we reach consensus. Uh, I... Hey, thanks for coming in, Joe. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for coming in. Uh, I, just, I called you here today because I was hoping that you could give me some advice. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, I'm really hoping to get some health care, and um, I feel like I'm not being represented in the Congress for that. OK. So I just want. Well, I'm trying to represent a lot of people. I, I mean, it's a big district. Well, I know, but I, I've written you several emails. I got them. Yep, and um, sent I, my... I, 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 because you have written me so many emails, I know who you are. Yes. <laughs> well, I am one of your constituents. Yes. <laughs> yes, I am... So do you know, you know that there are other people who I have to listen to as well? Well, sure, but... There's 20,000? Well, yeah, but I really want health care. I have heard you loud and clear. Here's the problem is no one else in your district wants to give it to you. What? You are the 15, they are the 85, and you are the 15%. We're the 85. Well, <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm sorry, I was just talking to these two guys right here. Yeah. We were actually just discussing your emails. Yeah. Uh, uh, this, is, this is Todd, this is Mark. Hi, Todd and Mark. Hi. Uh, Hi. They, we, uh, and so they, they are arm wrestling over, I don't, I didn't understand, but. Uh, <laughs> Sheila, Greg, I, I need to talk to you. Sure. What, yeah, there's up? a problem in our marriage. There are too many people in this conversation. Oh, yes. I, I thought the three of us did pretty well. I th well yeah, we're the three-legged stool of love. That's yeah. what she's told us. But well, this is I becoming think... like healthcare. Too many people are involved. <laughs> I don't think you can ever have too many people involved. No, Sheila, this is what I told you. He wants to cut out the abscess. One of us is the abscess. Which one, though? It's you. How do you know? I can tell. <laughs> I didn't know how to tell you but to bring Greg here. I also brought a real scalpel, too. Oh! Yeah, this is not even a joke at all. He's going to cut you. What? We, we always do things literally, like the literal three-person love stool that we yeah, have. But we for a while. It got expensive. And unwieldy. Oh. This is a cottage industry family, and we were getting too broad. That doesn't make, I heard it at a convention. What? I don't know what that means. Oh, oh. 
Sheila, if you want to franchise out, that's fine with us. But, yeah. But why me? Why, why am I the, the, the disease in this? Because you're 15% of us. Three divided by one is 15%. <laughs> Look, we have taken you. Oh, yeah. You've gone to Harvard. No. We, that, that bird flew into you, and some guy came out and said, I can get that bird out of him, and he's still alive. We held you as a child. We had a home birth, right? <laughs> Without painkillers. Yep. And you're still an asshole. <laughs> it's a one-eyed cat. Here. <laughs> I've named him Silver Bullet. <laughs> Hi, Darlin. Hi. Did you want a haircut or a... Exam? I'd like to do both. <laughs> I'd like I'd like car insurance actually. Oh, I can do that too. Can you do that? That's sure. great. Yeah. I was here first, but yeah. I can wait. Yeah, you're you're gonna have to wait because oh. uh because I'm getting car insurance. And Good. he's got more money. So okay. yeah. So uh what exactly are you looking for? Uh no fault ever insurance. Uh huh. We can do that. If I could just pay enough that it's always I always get to sue the person and win. No problem. Great. Mm hmm. You're gonna have to fight for it. Huh? Fight for it. With money? Sure. Okay. So, put money down or yeah. throw throw money at your face or what kind of how do I fight with money? That's really interesting. I've never heard of that before. Oh, haven't you? No. Oh yeah. That's how we do it in America. Okay. <laughs> Here come my troops. <laughs> <laughs> Look out! Oh, oh no! I won! My one hundred thousand dollars seems to have lost. <laughs> See, easy, right? I couldn't do that. No. <laughs> Uh, all right, so ladies and gentlemen, this is the part of the show we'll come to you all for some questions, but we actually uh, like to practice. In, uh, so what we're going to do is, uh, if you want to turn to the person next to you and ask them the question that you would ask of our guest, Mr. Dick Gephardt, uh, and maybe you'll make a friend, but you'll at least get a chance to practice. So uh, ready, set, go. <laughs> What do I want to ask? <laughs> I, uh, this will be interesting. Do you think all these people are in healthcare in some way? At some point, yeah. Either policy or actual delivery or yeah, something. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, all right. Uh, if you've got a question, we've got three folks walking around with microphones, so please just raise your hand real high so both I and the person with the microphone can see it. Uh, if you've got a question, please just uh, raise your hand. Oh, right there, right up, uh, right next, yeah, yeah, nope, yes, all right. Wendy came up with a good question. How could you afford to travel all this distance to Mayo for your health care? when you could have done it right there in your hometown? Oh, that's a, it's an interesting question. I mean, <laughs> you. Good question. I, I mean, so the question just uh, is why come to Mayo, uh, or how could you uh, pay to come to Mayo once a year when don't, isn't, don't they have health care? I haven't been to Missouri, so. <laughs> uh, Thank you all for coming. I don't know if they have you to Missouri to Please a do. Cardinal game. Um, <laughs> we have great health care in Missouri. We've got great health care in many, many places in the country. Uh, I, from my childhood, I had always heard people talk about Mayo. It, it, it has a legendary reputation. And uh, I have a good friend who had been coming here to Dr. Brennan and uh, after I got out of Congress, we were had a dinner, and he said, you, you just, you got to go there. He said, it, you, you just have to go there to see it. And so, you know, we didn't really, we weren't sick, we didn't have any problems, but I, I just wanted to see this operation. 
more than anything. So, and you know, Matt, my son, was treated at Washington U Children's Hospital. We we know well the quality and the greatness of St. Louis Healthcare. Washington U is one of the best centers in the country. But Mayo has a special sauce, I think, that that few have, and uh, I'm really impressed with what they're doing here. And I think. They, if they can get this out in other places in the country, as I said, I think it'll be a benefit to everybody. I mean, I just want to follow up on that because you uh, starting to come here at one point, I, I think that that's something that almost everybody has experienced where they've changed doctors at some point in their life. And it's a really difficult thing sometimes because senior doctor is sort of, it's a relationship. It's like you're dating that person almost. and. Or maybe you actually are dating that person, but no. But um, but no, it's like that. And so I, I feel like that when you were saying previously that it's that healthcare is so personal, that that is what part of what makes it so scary for people to think, oh my God, the government, or oh my God, my health insurer, or somebody is going to help me decide who it is that I'm dating. Um, that that's terrifying, isn't it? It is, but par part of the problem I think is that. As, as medicine has become much more specialized. So, you know, many, many people have an internist that they may have a long-term relationship with, but then they get sent to orthopedist or to a heart doctor or a this or a that or a whatever, and their records don't follow and there's no real communication. One of the things I really admire about this place is that your internist is in constant communication with all the people that you see here for various tests and analysis, and everything is held together, so there's connectivity. And uh, I think that's great. I, I think that's a real benefit. That's what I, when I say disorganized, that's what I mean, is, is that most consumers are just bewildered by the, the lack of organization, the lack of connectivity. All right, other, other questions. Do you have a question to raise your hand? To your left. Yes, I have a question. You were talking about how um, the healthcare bodies like Mayo should share their um, techniques, their information with others so that they can replicate them. But it is a business. Mayo is a brand. So why should they share when it's really a differentiating factor for them to attract more customers, more patients? That's a really uh, so that's a really interesting question. If I can just paraphrase it slightly, I mean, is healthcare? Uh, why should everyone share if it is at, at some point a business? If it's something that you know, if we're doing it really well, shouldn't we do it really well and not necessarily tell everybody because we want people to come here? Well, as I get it, and I may be wrong, I look to the Mayo people to set me straight. I, I think there's already been an attempt to cooperate with uh, internists and others around the country with Mayo information, Mayo best practices, and maybe there's an economic relationship that's created. The doctor in you know Paducah, Kentucky, can say to his patients, I have a relationship with Mayo, it's great healthcare, I'm using a lot of their methods, we can access a lot of their information, and that makes them more attractive to their, to their patient mix. I, I don't know if that's the case, that's just my sense, is that that could be done, and it could be done by, a, you know, Washington U could do that, and Cleveland Clinic could do that, and, and others could do that. This is a big country, a lot of patients. So there's a lot of business out there, and uh, others can do this. All right, other questions. I want to get to both sides. Uh, it seems like there's a bunch over left, here. Yeah. Um, You've got one on the left. I, I yes, on the a left. Very, here. very quick question. I want to know more about the one-eyed cat. What's what's the backstory? <laughs> want to know about the one-eyed cat? The one-eyed uh, cat. Oh, yeah. Is that is that a St. Louis? Yeah, uh, I don't know. St. Louisism. <clears throat> I think I learned it in the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, you, you get into a subject and there'd always be somebody come in and they had the answer, you know. This is, and it was always kind of stupid, 
and <laughs> not the answer. But you had to sit and listen to them go drone on about how this was the answer. So we, we began to call him one-eyed cat. Oh, here comes another one-eyed cat. <laughs> so we were always looking for two-eyed cats. If we could find them, we really wanted them. Washington is a sad place. Uh, uh, I, I will come to the middle. Uh, was there anything on the right? I just want to make sure everybody's getting a chance right there. Uh. Hi. Um, you talked a lot about as uh, healthcare as a product. I wonder if you could talk about the interesting intersection between healthcare as a product and healthcare as a right. Mm. Yeah. Um. <laughs> All right, <What>? next question. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Uh, um. <laughs> I, I, I talk about it as a price. Product is not the right word in my view. I, I, I used it because, uh, you know, we all buy products. We all want things. So you buy a car because you want to be able to move, move around. You want transportation. You, you buy a house because you want a place to live. You shelter. Uh, you buy food because you're hungry. And, and, and so we, we kind of look at healthcare as another in a line of products. But it really is, as I was trying to say, different in my view than everything else that we think of as a product. Because it is so important to us. And it is so emotional. And it is so vital that then we take it to a right. Now, I'm a Democrat, and you know, when we did Hillary Care, we were trying to get everybody covered, and we thought of it as a right. We didn't you know, make a big deal out of that, but we wanted everybody covered. We also felt that everybody ought to be part of the program, because whether you like it or not, you're going to need health care. I had a debate with Phil Graham when we were in the middle of Hillary Care, and he said, this issue is about freedom. You need to be free to buy health care or not buy health care. If you don't want to buy health care, you shouldn't have to buy health care. And when I got my time, I said, no, I don't think it's a matter of right and freedom. I think it's a matter of responsibility. If you, I, and I said to Phil, I said, Phil, if you're willing to say that we're going to let people die in the parking lot of emergency rooms who don't have health insurance because we're not going to treat them, then maybe you're right. Maybe we can say it's a matter of freedom. You can choose whether you want to die in the parking lot or whether you, you don't. But I think, you know, as long as we're treating everybody, uh, whether they have insurance or coverage or money or not, then it has become a right, and we got to figure out how we're going to pay for it. Who's responsible? And that, that was really the argument in the, the health care bill about getting everybody involved. So it's a right and a responsibility. I mean, if I can follow, why not trumpet it more as a right? I mean, especially, you know, for... I mean, especially for Democrats who have been working and championing this for 100 years, uh, I understand the, the lexicon around it being a responsibility, but I, if this is something that you really believe is at the fundamental level of what we owe one another as a community, as a society, why not go out there and like preach from the mountaintop, this is something that everybody should have? I guess it's because in our political dialogue, the Republicans always want to attack us as socialists, you know, who are do-gooders, welfare providers, bleeding hearts, and they are people for responsibility. And, and in, in our own self-protection, we want to say, no, we're for responsibility too. We think there are rights, but there's also countervailing responsibilities. You can't have one without the other. And if you really think about it, you can't. You need both. You need, you know, it, it all comes from us. We're the people. We the people. And so people have, should have a right, I believe that, but they also have a responsibility. That's the flip. All right, I think we have time for one more question, and you guys are going to fight it out, but over here I saw the hand first. If I oh, heard sorry. you right, you were mentioning that the change you thought was going to happen was going to be gradual and incremental. 
Um, I just wanted to say, you mentioned earlier the fact that many other countries have exactly the same problems that we do. And if this is going to be a marriage between technology and healthcare, the country that gets it right, the corporations that get it right, potentially will reduce both the expenditure on GDP in their own country, and perhaps the next round of very big high-tech countries is going to come from this area. So I was going to say maybe there's a way this isn't just slow and gradual incremental. There's slightly more urgency. What do you think? I, I, I didn't follow exactly what you were... Uh, could you say the last part again? The country that gets this right in terms of reorganizing healthcare around technology, there'll be two benefits. Yeah. One will be the reduction in expenditure on GDP. Right. The second will be it will spawn likely the technology base to be able to support it, which will be exportable. Right. So there's a certain urgency, perhaps, to find the solution, rather than thinking this is just going to be gradual, right. incremental. No, I understand. No, I, I think you're right. I, and and what, everything you said was correct, and we should be thinking of it more as a, a leap and not so incremental even though most things in life are incremental. But this one, we really need leaps. But having said that, I, I don't think either that information technology, while it will be a huge help, it's not a panacea. It, it, it isn't a silver bullet. It isn't a one-eyed cat. <laughs> it, it, it is part, is a it's a big deal, and it's a big part of the solution. And I, I heard from Dr. LaRusso when I was at the Innovation Center, they've got a project where they're doing something with IT in Alaska, where they're, they're allowing Mayo doctors to diagnose and send you know, information to places in rural Alaska where they have no doctors, I think. And so th those are huge breakthroughs. I mean, for, for people that have no medical technology or more medical presence, that's a huge deal. I, I just, nothing is a silver bullet in this. That, that's what I believe. And, and so while we should look for bigger leaps in areas like information technology, which are huge part of the puzzle, I don't think even that should be seen as a silver bullet. It's part of a number of things that need to be done. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, one more big round of applause for Mr. Dick Gephardt. Uh, oh, and uh, well, give, give, give them a chance. They're going to take the stage one more time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, one last time, the Theater of Public Policy cast. So you'll see, you'll see inside this uh, room right here, mm -hmm. you know, we need to take a leap. We need to go forward, and we've got a lot of uh, research funding, just a ton of research funding, so we can just throw it at the wall and see what sticks. Well, Bill. So if I... you just look at these two people, I will tell you what is going on okay. inside well, this room. Just... Go ahead. <laughs> now, this is karate, but it's frozen karate. So we're trying to observe pain in one particular moment, just so that we can get down to the essence of pain. Over here. Uh, over here, this is just, we're just, uh, we're just making him, we're just making him feel religiously depressed. <laughs> Do you see all the crucifixes in this room? We're hoping that he's going to come out the other end and he's going to feel better. So we're doing all sorts of stuff. Bill, I, I know that you're trying to open up your own health franchise and I'm glad that you're doing research, but I, I don't think this is the Mayo model that you told me about earlier. We have to innovate, man. This is so much, like, we have so much money for research. So I'm just doing stuff. It's great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sally and I have decided we're going to open up our own franchise healthcare center. Yep. But we've been a group here. Yes. You're going to leave me alone. No, we want you to branch out into Alaska. To Alaska? <laughs> right. But I am afraid of husky dogs. <laughs> You're just going to have to take that on, Larry. Well, 
The future is not for the faint of heart. All and right. the future of health care is serving all communities. Mm -hmm. Very well. Well, then I'm just going to sign the rent with your name. Thank it's you. It's your place. I'm going to Nome. Or someplace like that. <laughs> Hello. Thank you for coming to Nome. Oh, Thank you so much. It is so cold Hilbert, here. Let me just meet you. These are my dogs. Ah! Oh, it's very, they're very friendly. They're very friendly dogs. Then why Which are they is, lunging? They, you're the first human we've seen in 30 years. <laughs> Look, uh, we got a bipartisan thing with the Congress, but it didn't pass the House. I'm sorry. You can't get your tonsillectomy that you needed. You told me the slogans were working. I thought they were, but apparently up here in Nome, we don't have the same kind of telecommunications that everybody else does. And my letter didn't get there on time. Send him a tweet or a Facebook poke. <laughs> my screen is frozen. Nome gets us again! <laughs> <clears throat> so, I, know. Um, I was hoping that we could talk about this like adults. Fine, Fine. go ahead. Fine. Great. Um, here's the thing. When you said we were going to the Mayo Clinic and you said they had special sauce, I thought we were going out to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to talk with you as an adult. Great. But Great. I've been noticing what you've been eating for dinner and I think it's costing me more. <laughs> yes. Oh, I see. So you're a doctor now. I feel like a doctor. Oh. I've been on the internet. <laughs> now, what? take a look at this. This is my psyllium husk, mm -hmm. and this is your caramel sauce. Mmm, caramel sauce. You're probably happier than I am. I'm a but, lot happier. But I'm more regular. <laughs> it's true. Congratulations. Every time you take a drink of that caramel sauce, it is going to cost me more. My premiums are going to go up and up. Look, it's my right, right? I can, I can do whatever I want with my health. And I've been eating responsibly. Have you tasted this stuff? It's like sawdust. <laughs> Have you tasted this? Oh. <laughs> Just a dab. Just a dab. That's all it takes to start. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah, see? Okay, okay. Hard. Oh, oh, oh. oh. God. Now we're gonna negotiate with the insurance company. Yeah, we're gonna play hardball this we're time. We're gonna play hardball. Compensation's world. out. Yep. Worker benefits are out. It's all about health care. Lifetime maximum. Lifetime Remember those ma two There is no lives. such thing. Exactly. That's right. So. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> that is a maximum of lifetime pain. Why would you bring a, a, a gun to a discussion? A, a gun to a political fight? You've learned well. You listened in civics class. <laughs> so are we in agreement? Uh, we would prefer to have a lifetime cap. We had a memorandum with bullet points. <laughs> <laughs> Bullet points! There's a, that's a bullet point! That's a bullet point! He's hilarious and <laughs> dangerous. <laughs> Sign it! Thomas? Yes? You should know that medicine is a business, and this x-ray of your femur is the most incredible femur I've ever seen, and so I sold it. What do you... Yeah, there are orthopedic you... surgeons out there who would kill to see this. Wait, you, you sold my x-ray, or...? The well, femur. initially the, the x-ray, but everybody was interested in the femur itself, so I will be amputating. <laughs> Sorry. Well, get it. See who it is. Yeah, I'm here for the femur. We got the, we got the ice bucket. Great. There's a little boy in Nebraska that needs it. <laughs> Look, I know you want to die in this parking lot, but it's my Hippocratic oath I can't let you die in the parking lot. Because it's my parking lot of my hospital. It's my hypocritic oath to say, go ahead and die, but I care about health care. I'm a hippo. <laughs> <laughs> what? And I'm a hippie. <laughs> this is beside the point. He's dying. 
if you're gonna die, go to a Target parking lot or something. Why do you have to hang out in the hospital parking lot? Look, I'm a hypocrite and I'm pretending to care. Does anyone want to play Hungry Hungry Hippos? Because I'm starving. <laughs> Just let me go. Just. Why is there a hippo here? <laughs> I can't focus. Walk to the light. Walk to the light. Everyone must face an end to their natural life. We all have a duty to pass into the next realm. But I don't oh, go, spend... Grandma, don't go! No, Mrs. Thomas, really, your end will not be happy. We need your left so we'll never eat it again. And don't take the caramel sauce. Just, where is it? <laughs> really, Mrs. Thomas, the end should be pleasant. And it is time to go. This money spent now is chasing good money after bad. Kind of. <laughs> Unless you have no lifetime maximum. <laughs> then you could stay for a while if you so choose. <laughs> I'm so torn right now. Yes, well, maybe you should stay. You've... You, you don't want me now? No, I've got a full ledger. I've got a full ledger of people I gotta check up on. So I... Isn't this, I mean, aren't you supposed to like try to comfort me and talk me into coming with oh, you? Oh, I am going to comfort you, but I also know that in a free market, if there's time and money to live, you should enjoy it. <laughs> tell, 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 tell God he looks like Sam Waterston. Wheel of Fortune is coming on. Wheel of Fortune. I think you have many years left to share with your friends and family, and you have an endless cap, I mean an endless life of expectancies to enjoy. I'm gonna go make some lefts up for my kids. I'll... That's probably a good choice. I'll see you another time. Yes, in 12 to 15, or with minimum caps reaching 50,000 for your lifetime survival. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you all so much. You have been a fantastic audience.